I'm Femi OK. Today, the stream is teaming up with Human Rights Watch to take a look at their campaign to ban the close confinement and shackling of mentally ill patients and people around the world. Let me give you an example of what we're talking about. Here's Step Varsen reporting from Indonesia. For five months now, Pupun has been locked up in a cage where he lives in his own excrement. His family is sometimes too afraid to feed him. After he murdered his mother and mutilated her body, he was taken to a mental hospital. Four months later, he came back. They said he was cured, but after three months he became aggressive again. He injured the head of the village with a machete. His friend and I were also wounded. I'm worried if we will let him out again. So much to talk about shackling of mentally ill people, close confinement of mentally ill people around the world, and how do you stop that? Howa, it is great to have you here on the stream. Tell everybody who you are. Thank you very much, Bernie. Um, I'm Howa Ojefo. I'm the founder of She Rights Women, which is a movement in Nigeria here um, that gives mental health a voice by empowering people who actually live with mental health conditions to tell their own stories, co-create their own solutions, and advocate for their own rights. And it's important to know that I am also a person who lives with a mental health condition, quite a social disability as well. Good to have you, Hawa. Noah, hello. Welcome to the stream. Introduce yourself to the world. Hi, I'm Nofa Rianti Yusuf. You can just call me Nofa. Uh, I'm a secretary general for the Asian Federation of Psychiatric Associations. Um, I'm from Indonesia. It's nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you. Nice to have you here on the stream. And Shanta, welcome back to the stream. Remind everybody who you are. Thanks so much, Debbie. Pleasure to be here. My name is Shanta Rao Barriga. I'm the director of disability rights at Human Rights Watch. And today, uh, as you alluded to, we launched uh, a, a report called Living in Chains that mm. documents the practice of shackling people with mental health conditions in over 60 countries around the world. Shanta, you came well prepared with your report there, ready to hold up to camera. I've actually got it here on my laptop so people can see what we're talking about in close-up. This report took you a year to put together. Why is it so important? What do you want it to do? Well, first, we've been working on this issue uh, since I went to Ghana back in 2011, so almost a decade. Uh, and that was the first country where we documented the practice of shackling. And over the years, we've looked at this issue in Indonesia, in Somaliland, in Nigeria, how I knows that issue well. And we realized that there was, this was a global trend. And so today we put out a report that shows that hundreds of thousands of people with mental health conditions or psychosocial disabilities, men, women, children as young as 10 years old are put in chains at some point in their life or confined in small spaces. And as you, as you can imagine, uh, living in a shed, in, a, in an animal shelter, uh, forced to eat, sleep and urinate in that same tiny area, it's, uh, it's inhumane. And frankly, it's, it's torture, as uh, the UN experts called it themselves. Uh, and you know, they, the UN expert on torture denounced that it's unequivocally uh, a fact of torture if you put someone in shackles like we've seen these images just now. I'm looking at these images and I, I, I should say, and I have to say that some of them are really disturbing. So be ready for those images, because what we're talking about is uh, human rights abuses to, to people who don't have the ability to necessarily uh, protest about it. So Nareg Kh is on Twitter and he says, underneath this new report that Human Rights Watch is sharing, and I'm going to put this to you, Nova, I thought this was a thing of the past. Hashtag break the chains. Nova. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Shanta, for the report. Um, it has actually been my awareness since 2007 when uh, I read a report from the Ministry of Health that there were 18,000 people with mental health conditions being shackled, you know, in many forms, as being explained uh, before on the social media and also from the report. 
Uh, so that's why I said me. I had to make a very big decision at the time of my life. I decided to run as member of parliament because I, I thought that this uh, problem can only be resolved through um, regulations, such as from the mental health law. That's why I, I ran for parliament, and then I initiated the mental health bill, chaired the working committee, and then the bill was passed into law in 2014. But however, my intention to solve the violation of human rights that happened in Indonesia have not entirely succeeded. It has been six years since that the law has not been followed up in derivative regulation by the related ministries, especially the Ministry of Health as leading sector. So, um, yeah, it's actually very important um, to follow up the law because Indonesia is very diverse. It's very large geographically. It's the fourth most populous population in the world. And Indonesia has a regional autonomy system. There are 34 provinces, not to mention district, villages, and every leader is democratically elected by the people. So they do not necessarily care about mental health in general, let alone shackling. Therefore, um, I think that the regulation uh, issued by the president or a presidential decree is really needed. That's the only tool to bridge the government and local government so that they have the same perspective, concern, aims, and also coordination to succeed the target of the shackling free program. So um, I, I really think uh, we need this presidential level uh, decree uh, as a means of coercion. And if possible, law enforcement must also be done in, uh, in its implementation. I know it's not ideal, but I much prefer humanity you know, comes as a form of conscience instead of a byproduct of law. But well, yeah, Femi. I think I've talked too much. <laughs> I stopped for, uh, for a minute. Yeah. It's a whole, well, it's a whole point of the street. You, though, no, I wanted to ask you, though. I mean, you're, I think law is an important part. And one of the, the key asks from this uh, report in our campaign is that every country should ban the practice of shackling. And some countries are working yes. on that. Awa herself is helping to, to reach that in, in Nigeria. But you know that Indonesia's had a ban on shackling since 1977. It's in the laws for more than 40 years, and yet the practice still happens. So I think, in our view, there is much more that we need. We need... Uh, services and supports and to support, uh, for people with mental health conditions, we need to look at why they're shackled in the first place. It's because there's stigma and shame surrounded by uh, mental health conditions. There's a lack of government uh, provided services, uh, supports, and not just mental health medical services. We're talking about a holistic approach that needs to be implemented. And governments need to invest in job training, housing, and ways to keep people out of shackles, out of institutions and psychiatric hospitals, and instead productive members of their society. So it's a much broader uh, toolkit that we need in order to address uh, what's been a decade-long problem in Indonesia, as you very well know. But frankly, me, we looked at this in over 60 countries. You mentioned how countries, yeah. You mentioned Howard, uh, oh, and I, I want to bring yeah. her into the conversation. Also, because Nigerians are in this conversation as well, Howard, let me let me show you two things. Absolutely. One's a tweet, and then one's a, a, a video from Human Rights Watch about a Nigerian healing centre. Let's start on my laptop, first of all, with the tweet. So this is Haroon, and Haroon okay. says, when we're talking about shackling here, that it is a rampant practice in most places in Nigeria, in spite of inhumane treatment and physical abuse associated with it. Mental health issues are alluded to, spiritual attacks. Uh, victims are mostly stigmatized and often not given orthodox treatment. So there's that that Haroon is saying. And then Human Rights Watch actually went to something they called a Nigerian healing center this was just last year let's have a look what list our feet are chained this way we can't walk around and we just sit quietly it has been five months since the chain was put on my legs it hurts when i walk so however this is not just nigeria shanta was saying that there are 60 countries that still have shackling and close confinement. Can you explain to us in the context of Nigeria why it happens? Um, so it's, it's a whole n number of things. And I think it's just every... On the one hand, you have, you know, um, the fact that Nigeria's last mental health legislation was in 1958. So we have that going for Nigeria, that the current... 
um, you know, the, the current trends on mental health, especially the human mental health and the practices, the welfare system that needs to be incorporated. So we have that going on. And then on the other hand, we also, I always say that we cannot have a conversation around mental health and its practices without also having a conversation about the system in terms of, you know, the structures that are available. And Shanta mentioned something about it. Because a lot of times what happens is, you know, you don't have the facility. In Nigeria, you have one psychiatrist to what, 1.3 million thereabouts, um, um, you know, Nigerian. So that is a huge deficit for where people can go to in terms of taking mental health support. Nigeria has not adequately invested in community-based mental health care at all. You know, we do not have mental health at the primary health care level still, even though it was something that was reflected in the national um, you know, mental health policy as far back as 1991 and revised, um, you know, in early 2000s as well. Nigeria has ratified, you know, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities about a decade ago, and still we don't see that being reflected in legislation and in terms of practice as well. I mean, of course, Nigerians are also very religious people. So I think that's already another aspect of, you know, the intricacies in terms of dealing with this. And I think it's mostly not just about the religion, but about the understanding as well. Um, a lot of people do not understand mental health as, you know, as part of your health. They understand it as this thing, like, you know, like the person on Twitter said, it's, you know, is this spiritual attack? So what do you do when you don't understand something? You push it away, you segregate it, you chain it so that it doesn't affect you know, you all the people that are, you know, supposedly okay. So I think it's... How I'm going to pick up now. Yeah, I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to pick up. I guess one of you yeah. have got a, a computer that keeps pinging, and I'm going to ask you to see if you can if you can silence it. Nova, I think it might be you. All right, maybe people are messaging you saying you're on TV. If you could silence that, that would be the best thing ever. Let me just check in with YouTube. Ashwani Kumar wants to know, Shanta, are these practices also happening in India? A lot of people on YouTube right now are chatting back and forth saying, is this happening in our country? Does this happen here? India, Shanta. Yes, uh, sadly, it is happening in India. Um, it's happening in countries all around the world. Uh, we found in, um, in India, just in January of last year, the media reported that there's thousands of people who were found shackled uh, in the, quote, like cattle, their feet tied with iron chains and padlocked. Padlocked. Uh, those were the conditions uh, just in one state in India. And we've been working with local organizations there. Again, groups like Hawa's that are people of, they're made up of people with mental health conditions. And that's really important to this work because we need to make sure that we're making, we're emphasizing the voices of people with lived experience with mental health conditions in India and elsewhere. It's happening in uh, Guatemala. It's happening in Morocco. It's happening in uh, Pakistan. It's happening in uh, many countries across uh, pretty much every continent where where we've documented the shackling, and it's it's frankly astonishing to me that you could enter uh, a, a facility in Indonesia and a facility in, in Nigeria, and it's the idea that someone with a mental health condition should be chained is a, is about treating them less than a human being at the end of the day, and I think that concept is universal, and for me that's the most haunting because. Uh, People should live in dignity and not in chains. Mm. Um, I, I want to share this um, because we were talking to various uh, mental health advocates around the world. And Sheikha is a global mental health professor from Harvard University. And he put some context into why this is happening. We're surprised that in 2020, shackling and close confinement is happening. And as Sheikha explains, gives us some context. Let's have a listen. Nobody wants to chain a person who's part of the family. They do it because they have no choice. And it's for the governments to provide evidence-based and right-based care as a part of the universal health coverage so that people are not chained. We don't shackle people who are suffering from cancers, from blood pressure, from diabetes. Why should we do that for people who are suffering from mental disorders? Just because their behavior sometimes can be abnormal. They are, the mental illnesses are just like other physical illnesses and they can be treated, the people can become all right and can be a very useful and constructive part of society for themselves and for others. 
No, but do you want to pick up from there? You were, you were nodding. It, that resonated with you. Uh, yeah, I've been listening to how I know so Shanta. It's almost the same in Indonesia. Um, experiences of psychosis in Indonesia truly um, embody the case of bad luck, black magic, stigma, and of course, defenseless existence of the people with mental conditions. So at present, uh, the lack of adequate mental health care uh, services and also the scarcity of resources um, exceed the uh, ability for families to cope and also the capacity um, for medical professionals to deliver quality care, which in the end leads to um, the practice of shackling or um, the presence of imaginary alternative treatment not based on clinical reality. Uh, or even uh, if you have access to care, then you have these dire states of mental health facilities. Um, so therefore, uh, Femi, this thing still happens in Indonesia because of uh, these experiences of psychosis itself, uh, particularly with certain um, cultural or traditional setting. Mm. When we look at living in chains as, as a report, as a, an investigation, is it also, Shanta, is it also an expose as well? Are you bringing Absolutely. information that the countries themselves maybe not know about their mental health practices? In many cases, the, the governments know, the communities know, uh, but it is a hidden practice. It's invisible. And so I do think by calling this out, this is the first global report that shows the scale and the breadth of the chaining. And we hope it draws attention to governments to say, well, we need to do something about it. It's it's an embarrassment. It's frank. It's a human rights violation, and there are practical steps you can take. And I and I do have hope. You know, I, I visited a man in Ghana in April 2017, and he, when I approached him, uh, he was chained to a tree. He was wearing just a very small red cloth around his waist, and uh, the chain was about one meter long. And that one meter was the radius of his life. There were roosters running around in the same facility that were more free than this man who had been chained to this tree for five years. And we worked together with local advocates and people with lived experience and put pressure on the government. And they actually came and sawed the chains off of Felix and 15 others in that camp in Ghana. And I met him a couple of months later and you could see he had gained weight. He had he was smiling and he was free. And you can, with pressure, actually bring about change. And governments can do things once they're aware and once they're called out on it, which is why we need to be out there. And not just those of us who are in this field, but frankly, anyone who's watching the show, there, we've launched a campaign today called hashtag break the chains. You can go to break-the-chains.org and you can take a pledge that you are committed to helping end the stigma and the shame around mental health and to working to call out these abuses and put pressure on governments to, to do what they did in Ghana, uh, to, to let Felix free. But in so many countries, there's still hundreds of, of thousands of people who are not yet free. Let me take you to Uganda, uh, and this is Miro, he's a disability rights advocate, and he talks about how a campaign like Break the Chains can actually help mentally ill people who are being put in close confinement, who are being shackled. This is what he told us earlier. In Uganda, shackling is a very huge issue. Many children, many youth are put on chains, especially in rural communities where people still think that if you have mental illness, then you are bewitched. Now the fact that we have this campaign all over the world, I'm looking at this to end in Uganda, and there's a need to involve the traditional healers and religious leaders to understand mental health and how to support this campaign. I'm also looking at human rights to be supported, human rights rights to be supported, to change this book into local language so that everyone can read and understand it. Together we can end the shackling in the world. All right. All right. You should have gone That's straight to Shanta because Shanta, Shanta, Shanta was just I'm smiling so like this. Excited. It was like, <laughs> get to that smile straight away. That's right. All right, Shanta, why are you smiling? I mean, Go ahead. That's right. Well, it's yeah. inspiring to see that when we join forces collectively, we can do so much. We can call this out. We can put pressure on governments. 
And we can, as he said, reach out to those who are major influences in, in countries like religious leaders, uh, football players, people like you, Femi, who are helping us uh, highlight this issue, shine a light on these abuses and can bring about some change. So I look forward to working with Michael and so many others on the ground, people like Hawa, who have tremendous courage and strength and so many lessons that, and that we can learn from them on how to move away from the shackles and restore the dignity. I'm very excited, very, very excited. So, no, but you talk. Breakthechains.org. You got to go check out the website. Using our platform for her platform. Nova, <laughs> you talked. Yes, you yes. talked at the beginning of our conversation about uh, political will, getting politics involved yeah. in mental health, and that's how change can happen. Can you tell us any success stories? Because we're showing the worst that can happen. What about the best? Well, um, there are several initiatives being done um, in Indonesia because I mentioned earlier about how we have this regional autonomy system. So I, I wouldn't really call it a success for me, not yet. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But at least there's an effort here and there. Um, so I noticed there's a province in Indonesia where the governor uh, is a woman who was once the Minister of Social Affairs. Uh, she created a program called e Pasung. Uh, Pasung means shackling in Indonesian. So this program enables to find out where the shackling occurs, including by name, by address. So the person could be found and referred to uh, a hospital and also continued for care at the rehabilitative center managed by the Ministry of Social Affairs. But I, I don't know where this one is going, but somehow I appreciate um, the effort being done. Uh, surprisingly, it's being done by a female leader in Indonesia. And uh, I'm not saying anything specific about gender issue, but I'm just very glad that she, uh, out of many um, leaders in Indonesia, she came up with this initiative. Mm. Let me bring in well, the voice of Dr. Documented, uh, sorry, just to jump in, just to highlight also what Indonesia's done. Yes, They've yes. done this knock knock initiative. You might be familiar with it yes. better. I don't know the, the formal name in Bahasa, but it's this initiative that you see in the video just there where people are going door yes. to door. They're speaking to people to find out about a range of, of health issues where mental health is one of them. So it's integrating yes. mental health into the primary health care system. And then they're able to detect cases of shackling. They're able to educate. They're able to provide links to services and it's a, as I understand, it's reached 48 million households, about 70 percent of Indonesia, which is a great initiative. And we've highlighted this in the report as well. And we need more oh, efforts like Thank this. Thank you, Shanta. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm hearing is a hopeful this is note. A good story from the Ministry of Health. Yes. So what I'm hearing is is a hopeful note. Let me let me continue on that note. Dr. Frida Kometi uh, is a clinical psychologist at the Africa Mental Health Research and Training Foundation. She has some ideas about how how do we stop shackling around the world? Just ban it and stop it. Here she is. Some of the things that we can do to prevent that is uh, changing legislation, uh, making sure that policies to protect their rights. Also creating awareness through education. Uh, education of mental illnesses uh, will help stop stigma, will also uh, help us uh, change our culture and attitudes and the language that we address mental health illnesses. It, we can also do that by providing psychosocial, uh, psychosocial rehabilitation, which will help us focus on their skills and their abilities instead of their symptoms and their illnesses. Mm. That brings us to the end of the show. I have less than one minute left. What would you like us to do in that one minute? Let me just remind you, audience, have a look here on my laptop. It is out today. So go to at HRW at Human Rights Watch on Twitter. And then you can see the reporting that they have done over the past year, looking at the shackling of people with psychosocial disabilities worldwide. There is a lot of information there. Shanta says that you can be part of the campaign as well. It's not just about being on Al Jazeera. It's not just about being on TV. We can be part of the solution. Howa, Nova, Shanta, Thank you so much for being on the stream today. We really appreciate your input. If you tweeted to us, if you were on YouTube, we thank you very much as well. Femi OK, signing off from the Home Edition Stream Studio. See you next time.